Lovely to see you all again. Thank you guys for coming out yesterday morning. We had a lovely breakfast, good time of chatting and food at McDonald's down the road there. So thanks, thanks for turning up for that. That was good. Um, very exciting. If you're, if you're free tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we're hosting, uh, I'm part of a combined churches initiative called the Christian Crisis Caravan. No doubt my small friend Luke talked about that once or twice when he was here. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, so, yes. So uh, we're going to meet here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. just to continue things. Uh, yeah, if you want to know what that's about or, or come and have a listen or just observe, it's exciting. Um, yeah, we've linked in with a few chaplains and... Uh, we thought we might have someone in the caravan towards the end of the week, but but um, that didn't work out. They found other accommodation. Um, but yes, yeah, so that, that was fine. It's it's to be used. Um, if you know someone who's in need or in crisis who needs uh, some accommodation, there's a caravan that a number of churches have helped set up. We can take it to where we want. So that's very exciting. So that's just a little bit of a side note. Starting a new uh, sermon series called Doors. Um, look at that, isn't that lovely? Lovely door there. My wife did tell me what paint that was. Um, uh, oh, that is, yes. <laughs> yes, do you like something? Yes, and that's the beauty of Google and images, and so you never know what might pop up. But, but uh, yes, but the, over the next few weeks, we'll look at being a door to a number of different things. This morning, it's a door of encounter as we see different people that encounter Jesus um, and also and through the next couple of weeks uh, we'll be talking about that we are that door that helps people find life and hope and faith. So that's sort of where we're going to go over the next uh, four weeks. We'll see how we go, see what we do, see what we learn together, but let us pray. Father God, I thank you that we can just take a few moments now to enjoy your word. Enjoy hearing from you. Holy Spirit of God, just come and connect with our lives in this place today. As we be your people of hope and person, person, as we be your people of hope and perseverance here and wider fields. Thank you, Lord, that we may be the only Jesus that anyone ever sees. And may we be honoring him in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe and I hope you'll agree that. We all need to encounter God's love and grace and power and salvation. We need to be walking a road of hope and following the plan He has for our lives as we trust in Him. On the screen there is Psalm 25 and the first five verses. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. Nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in, the, in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God and Saviour and my hope in you. My hope is in you all day long. Where does your hope lie? Sometimes our hope, sometimes our faith is tested. We wonder what God is up to. David, the writer of this psalm, knew that his hope was in the Lord. He had encountered him, he'd seen him provide for him and his life. And all throughout the Bible we witness people having encounters with God. As God steps into their life, as God shows up, as God interrupts what's happening, disturbs their day, as God makes his presence known and changes their lives. We can be a door. You and I can be a door to helping someone encounter the living God. It's simple. Maybe we can pray with them. Maybe we can pray for them. Maybe we can ask God to show up and interrupt their day. Maybe we can help them out practically or physically or emotionally or spiritually. Maybe we can take the time to be a friend and show them some Christian love and grace and kindness. 
Moses in the book of Exodus, second book of the Old Testament. He was busy looking after some sheep and God showed up. God got his attention and he sees this bush that's on fire and thinks that's interesting but it's not getting burnt. God used an ordinary bush in an amazing way to get Moses' attention. But God needs to have an encounter with him. It's Exodus chapter 3, 1 to 11. Now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Friends, God will use whatever he can to get our attention. He will use whatever he can to get my attention. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Well, wouldn't you? While the bush does not burn up, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called, for, called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. When God calls your name, I encourage you to say, Lord, here I am. God wants to see you move towards him. Let's get ready to hear God speak our name. After he gets your attention, and after he got Moses' attention, he says, hey, I'll go and see this strange thing. Don't miss it when God shows up. Don't miss it when God wants an encounter with you. We continue to read. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. God sees. God is concerned. God wants us to understand his heart for people. When we have an encounter with God, he usually has something to say to us and something for us to do. He has a word for us and an action. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hovitites, and Jebusites, and Benjamites. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry, no. <laughs> yes. Uh, how many times have I read those words? Uh, many times. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, says God, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? God, who am I? I'm tending some sheep. I've done some things wrong. That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. When we walk through that door and meet with God and encounter His love and hope and salvation, however that has looked for you, that could be a number of times or a few times when you just encounter the presence of God and you know there's a call and a purpose on your life and no doubt we've all said, God, why me? Why now? Who, who am I? 
that I should go and do this thing. And we see that door before us. And with a shaking hand, we turn that knob and say, Okay, God, let's go through that door. Be the best you you can be. For God sees our becoming. Who we, who we are becoming matters. Friends, and it's in the falling down, it's in the getting up, it's in the toiling and misery and wins and losses and all the other stuff in life that we need to process and experience, but let us not give up. Be the best teacher you can be. So parents will want to put their kids in your class. Be the best plumber, be the best mother, be the best father, be the best business person. Be the best friend, be the best neighbour, be the best truck driver, be the best gardener, be the best whatever God's called you to be. It's not because you are a Christian, but why you are a Christian. And you have encountered the living God who goes before you. Let us honour him in our words and deeds and actions. People had Jesus all the time throughout God's Word. Throughout the New Testament and throughout His ministry that encountered Jesus along the roads of life. Jesus had a special connection with Lazarus and his family in John chapter 11. His, his friend was sick and dying. We see a real pouring out of emotion and love and concern for this family and for his friend Lazarus. Because they all believed that Jesus had got there a little sooner, he would have been able to help out their, his sick friend. But now Lazarus is dead and buried and they think all hope is lost. But Jesus had a greater miracle in mind. A great encounter. Something great to reveal to all those people that were coming to mourn their friend and brother's death. Lazarus was about to hear the voice of God, the voice of Jesus, his friend, from the grave. It's John 11, 38 to 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of those people standing here, that you may believe. That, you, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. A life restored. I wish we had some dialogue between Lazarus and Jesus. I'm sure the first thing Lazarus was said would be, What on earth were you thinking? I was in paradise. I was, now I'm here. What's going on? What are you doing? But we don't have that luxury. Friends, when we encounter Jesus, it's on His terms. When we encounter Jesus, it's on His terms. Jesus is great at making dead things come to life, come alive, restoring dreams and hopes and relationships, plans, purposes. As we encounter Him this morning. Maybe some of these stories are very for me, or maybe they're not. But when God is involved, miraculous things happen. Lazarus, come out. 
What's your Lazarus that needs to spring to life again? In Jesus' name. Step through that door. Have some courage. Have some hope. I saw these two funny cartoons the other day that will miraculously appear. Ah, oh, good. You idiot! He said, cast the nets! Not cast a nets! Oh, there you go, that got two laughs. Thank you, the three of you. Yes. Wait, there's more. One more. And God separated light from the dark. Yes. There you go, gentlemen. That's a tip for you this week when you're helping your wife sort the washing. I still get it wrong. Uh, yes. Moving on. As we step through that door, may we encounter God. Possibly one of the most powerful encounters you can disagree or not disagree is certainly the transformation of Saul into Paul. Saul, the Christian killer, becomes Paul, the life saver, missionary, preacher, miracle worker. John chapter 9. We'll finish with this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that he found any there who belonged to the way, which was what Christian or early Christians were called, because they were following the way of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. With a man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so he, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Friends, God might interrupt your day and your plan. Friends, Jesus needed to get this man's attention. And so he did. Where are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus. Sorry, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. When we encounter Jesus, things change. People around you may not get the full picture, but keep trusting in God. The guys that were with Saul had no idea what was going on, but they knew something had happened. And in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told me to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man. I'm sure he had. And all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all, all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this is my man. This is the bloke that I've chosen. The instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Saul becomes Paul. This encounter was dramatic and drastic and life changing. A whole new course of this man's life was today set on a path of hope and salvation, of ministry and mission, of life-changing power 
through the name of Jesus. Without Paul, the church would not advance so dramatically as it did from that point. Total change from death to life. Don't miss those doors of encounter. Don't shut the door of possibility. Don't close doors to those people around you who need to experience Jesus Christ. I want to see Jesus more clearly and hear God more loudly. God bless you. Amen.